I'm at the Medical College of Wisconsin. This is our campus. We're a, a, a multi-hospital center. We have, I believe, five, five sites off of the main campus. This is our main campus here. I personally have used Monaco uh, quite some time. This is just a, a quick a quick timeline of when we got it. We got it in 2007. We added Agility Infinity equipment in, in 2013 and have been planning that since then. We've got some Siemens systems, but for the most part right now, we have mainly a, a, a majority of our equipment is elected. I believe we have 11 the units and two Siemens units at the moment. So in terms of planning, we do, well, in terms of planning, we do, we have about 200, 250 patients under treatment across all the sites at any given point in time. And we're generating probably like on the order of 60, 70 plans a week. We were predominantly a Monaco site. We have, I believe, 36 systems total total now, or 36 licenses. In terms of workstations, we have 21 that spread out over 10 dosimetrists that run those. So on average, we're, we probably have about two systems per person. So that just gives you a little background. In general, I, I run dosimetry at my center. I oversee all of the dosimetrists and just planning, commissioning. I probably, I personally work on maybe two to three cases a week, more challenging ones that the dosimetrists are struggling with. So to get started, if, if any of you have used Monaco, I assume that the group has as a whole. Monaco tends to, well, it's Monte Carlo, so it, it's a little slower. I, I saw Adam's talk last week and that, that was Eclipse. The, the format of this is going to be a little different. I actually have two separate plans that we can look at and I plan on kind of going back and forth between the two. So I thought that it would be best if we started with something that is more likely to complete in the hour that we have. Um, so you can see how we set it up. So to begin at, at our center, our physicians give us, a, we call it a wish list. Basically it's a, a written planning directive. So I, I, I grabbed a case that I've anonymized here. And this is the prescription that I'm gonna go off of when I generate this plan. So I, I'd like to start with something basic like a, a prostate only plan and, and start from there and explain to you what exactly I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it. And then while that one's running in the background, I'd like to move and, and also look at us another one I have, the, the prostate and nodes. Let me zoom in on a little bit on that so you can see that. So let's, let's start with the prostate only, move that over. So when I usually begin a treatment plan, I, I tend to go over th through things in order. Senji had, had, should have sent everyone a, a link to the Monica VMAT optimization file. I put this, this file together last week as a sort of general guidelines that I use when I plan. So hopefully you find that to be a little helpful, but I try to be somewhat systematic when I, when I approach this. I do save templates, but I, if for the purpose of today, I, I didn't want to do a template. I want to build the plan ground up just so you guys can see what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna save this and we'll go back. WIP, I, I refer to this as a work in progress. So here we can, we can say no to that. So I've got this plan set up here. Normally when you bring in a template, if, if you've planned previously, obviously these will all be populated with constraints. So normally what I, I like to do anytime I work on a plan is I set ISO center and I'll, I'll def define it. We use three point BBs on our CT scan. So if you look, we mark all of our patients this way and then we'll put an ISO. In this case, I placed an ISO center at the center of mass of the, the PTV70 for this prostate. If there's contrast agent, which you can see looks like there's some in, this, in the bowels here, then we take care of that. I do find it's very helpful to use the synthetic CT function to make sure that I'm forcing things properly. So you can see in here, we, we actually contour all density that needs to be forced at any contrast, and we call that force density. And then I assign that a value to one. We do assign treatment couches. So we have a treatment couch library that we use, and we have all the components of that. Depending on the couch that you're using at your center, I highly recommend that for sure chest, like chest, pelvis, definitely try to include the couch. In head and neck areas, we, t we don't always include the couch. The density of our extension board is pretty low. So obviously you wanna make sure that, that those things that you have, have assigned ready to go. In this case, this is our prescription. We're going to, I'm prescribing to a volume. So in this case, 95% of PTV70 is gonna be our goal. Now that document I, I did send out is I, I put a section in here for beams and so page 10 here. Let's just sort of scroll to that, that section. So 
there's a couple of things. These are sort of some guidelines that I have, but in general, I, I, I like to, like for instance, in, in a case like this, a prostate only, I like to do a full arc, but I also like to make sure that I'm not using, I, I use two, two separate arcs. So I, I like to do full arcs with a collimator at 20 degrees and a collimator at 340. This helps to prevent the interleaf leakage, the intraleaf and interleaf leakage, mainly the intra, intraleaf leakage, the, the leakage between each MLC. So you get less dose undulations in the plan while it's calculating. And then the other parameter that is, is this is going to be different. So I, I did notice in, in Eclipse, Eclipse compared to Monaco, Monaco, a lot of these things you have to control for yourself. So I, I'm going to go through some of these parameters a little bit. So again, in a case like this, um, if you're doing two arcs and we have it set for one arc per rotation, I find it's always good to, to do a, start with a counterclockwise. Usually the the KV cone beam on the LINAC is going to be ending and it, it does a clockwise. So a counterclockwise as it uh, is a better starting point. It, it's a little more efficient. So if you're going to do a single arc, then you can see it here. I, I've got these two beams. The increment, I like to, to talk about this for a second. So this can be a little confusing, but basically the increment is if you look here, the, the optimization is going to create an ideal fluence map at whatever increment you specify. So you can see right now it's creating, it's going to create these ideal fluence at each of these points on the 360 degree circle. So you can see as I march through where they are. So the, there, there are some advantages. If you're having a problem getting a plan to look good in stage one, I recommend you reduce this number. So, I mean, in this case here, I have it set to 30. If, if you see, if I, if I drop this increment to 20 on these, and then we took, take a look now, now they're being incremented every 20 degrees. So the value here is that you can produce a better dose distributions at the end of stage one. Now, if you change the increment, you probably also need to consider a couple of things. Sequence parameters. So in this case, I have it set up to 180 degrees per arc. So if, if we're doing 20 degree increments, that's 18, uh, eight, relative, relatively speaking, 18 fluence maps to generate that single arc. So I'm giving it about 10, 10 control points per arc to reproduce this. It, it might be at this point advantageous for you to increase this number maybe to, to 270 if you're gonna go a little lower. In general, around 30, 30 uh, 180 is a, is a pretty good starting point, 180 per arc. So again, collimator angle is, is here, the 20 and the 340 that I'm gonna use. And then I do assign my treatment couch. And, I, and in this case, I, I have no bolus. So I did wanna briefly mention, I don't know what other centers are doing. In general, these are the guidelines that our center uses for grid spacing. So normally for Photon Monte Carlo, we're using three millimeters. For SBRT cases, we drop that to two millimeters. Our collapse cone convolution that we use in this here, we use 0.25. And then for electrons, we use three millimeters. In the, in the demo today, in the light of, in light of time, and I want, to, I want you to see this, I'm actually going to probably increase this a little bit, just, just so you guys don't have to wait for the optimizer to calculate so long. So we'll, we'll bump that up a little bit. Now, the, there's, there's a couple of things here. There's different modes of optimization. And I, I do have a section on that in this document. But un, unlike Eclipse, where we're playing with weights, there's an op, the, the optimizer settings on here will automatically adjust weights that aren't manually forced. So when you're in Pareto mode, you're going to spend, it's going to try to make sure that all of your targets meet even if certain constraints are being violated for organs at risk. If we're in constraint mode, it's going to try to meet, put as much dose in the target, but always meet the organ at, organ at risk constraints. So in this case, I, I will, in general, my practice is to always do a constrained and then I will run the plan in multi -criteria, with multi-criterial optimization enabled for stage one. For stage two, I, I, will, I like to try running it with the MCO and constrained on, and then I'll switch it to Pareto. If, it, if it's not coming together, I may switch it to Pareto for stage two. So let's, let's pull up my, my constraints here. Give me a second. I should have these in the background. So this is the prostate only we're going to do first. All right, maybe I can minimize this a little bit so everyone can still see it. And then we'll, we'll kind of go through these. So 
Briefly, usually my target is, is I, I, I find it, it's good to put two, two target penalties. This is a pretty standard practice for something that I would do. So in this case, I'm going to do 7,000 at 95%. I've, I, I like to put a second one in here. And in this case, I like to do 7,000 and I multiply this times 98%. So 6860 and 98%. Okay, by default, I, I find that this is pretty good. So they, the next thing that I like to do is control the max, maximum dose inside of the structure. And to do that, I don't use the maximum dose constraint. Instead, I, I use quadratic overdoses. I tend to make adjustments to statistical uncertainty as I'm optimizing. And if you use max dose constraints, it tends to over constrain the optimizer and you might get noise that uh, max doses that are, are really actually just noise in the, the algorithm. And it tends to have a hard time getting a target coverage if you do that. So in, in general, I, I try to use quadratic overdoses as much as possible and not to use maximum point doses. So in this case, the protocol that I have, they're, they're hoping that I keep it under 7490. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take half of that, the distance between the max point dose, so the, the, the 490, I'm going to divide that into two. So we're going to go with 245, so 7245 here. And I use this constraint in stage one, and I usually turn it off for stage two. So then we're going to take this, the 7490, and that will be what we mainly use in stage two. So now our target is set. Now, I noticed that in Eclipse, it's probably more likely that you use ring structures or annual things like this. The nice thing about Monaco is it does us, uh, allow us to do a couple of things internally without having to create structures. So in this case, I'm going to do a 7490, and I'm going to turn the shrink margin off for the target. So what this now will do is, I'm, well, let's turn this off. I just want you to see, I, I use this tool quite often, and this is cost function occupancy. I, I strongly encourage everybody to have this on while they're setting up their constraints. This will allow you to see as you create your string or your constraints, how they're impacting the plan. So right now, all of this red area is 100% impacted. You can see here, this one here, this, is, this has a shrink margin on it. Let's, I'm just going to delete that one, and then we'll create a new one. So let's add, and we'll create. So. In this case, let's create one now at the prescription, but we're gonna have a shrink margin on here. So I find it, it's, it's helpful. You can, you can run it at zero. If you're running it at, at the final grid spacing of like 0 0.3 or 0 0.2 for SBRT, it, it can be helpful to maybe use about half of a pixel size. So in, in this case, for our demonstration, I, I'm actually not gonna push the dose quite so hard. So I might put like 0.25 in here, half of our half of our grid, or maybe maybe 0.3 just to just to be a little safe. So it's going to let the dose spill out a little bit on the PTV. But in this case, I'm using such a large a coarse grid for the demonstration that I think this will help our our target coverage out a little bit. So does everybody under? I, I'm hoping everyone understands the cost function occupancy. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna turn off this. But you can see in here, this function here is only penalizing areas outside of the prostate. So by using a quadratic overdose, it actually creates a ring structure for me. I don't have to, I don't have to create a separate ring with a contour and assign it. I'm just going to use the shrink margin on there. Okay, let's, let's go to some of the organs. So the rectum and bladder, in, in this case, they're, they're very similar constraints. So I'll, I'll tell you, in general, at our, at our site, we tend to use serial cost functions for this. So in this case, I find that a good starting point is probably something like around 5,000 here, and then a, a power exponent. So the power law exponent, a, a value of one corresponds to the target mean dose. It, it converts this function into controlling mean dose on a structure. If you increase it to 20, it, it more behaves like a maximum point, maximum point dose constraint. So you can think of this as the, the more to the, the closer to one it is, it's, it's a parallel structure. And the closer to 20 in it, it, it behaves as a serial structure. So I find that like starting at somewhere between like five and seven for a, a rectum and bladder is a good starting point. So maybe let's, let's start out with seven here, okay? 
And in this case, we don't have to include anything. If you look here now and we go to cost function occupancy, so this is the rectum, I'm only gonna be optimizing here. I could include the PTV and you'll see that it's gonna, it's gonna cut out some of the, some of, it's gonna drop some of those. If you do do that though, just keep in mind, you might have to make some adjustments on your ISO constraint. This, the equivalent uniform dose, you might have to drop. If there's a lot of overlap with the PTV, you'll, you'll definitely have to drop it. If it's a, a minimal amount, you, you might not need to. So you can do it either way. In this case, we'll just exclude it for the, for the sake of demonstration. It, it, it's gonna have relatively little impact because of the, the size of it compared to what we're looking at. And then I'm gonna do something similar. So the nice thing about, about the serial is I don't have to put a constraint in for each of these values, some DVH value. Instead, think of the equivalent uniform dose as like a, the, the an equation, right? Where, where the, the mean dose, like your mean point dose line is passing through. So if, do I have, can I annotate here? So like, if this was my like 5,000 point line and I, I'm controlling a line through here like this, right? And then as I, as I increase the power law exponent, the pitch of this gets more. So this would be like, 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 well, in this case, this is K, like a K equal, this would be like a K equal 10 here. And this line here is more like a K equal five. Okay. So in this case, I, I, I'm trying to get something that meets this 45. So let me, let me, uh, can I clear here, clear drawings. Okay. And I'm going to turn my annotation off. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with these annotation tools here. I will turn this, turn this off for a second. And let's go back. So I, I need to hit 4,000 less than 35, 65 less than 10, and 70 less than three. So I'm going to try to hit all of those points, but I'm only going to use one constraint for it, and that, that's a serial constraint. OK, and I'm going to turn this off. And you can see the cost function, that's the bladder. So you can see, I, I, I can turn the, sh the shrink margin on or off, but there's very little that's actually overlapping my PTV 70. So it's, it's something that even if I have it on or off, it's not gonna make much. And then I'm gonna do the same thing again, and I'll do seven in here, okay? So that leads us to the next two. So normally I would do something on the, something like a quadratic overdose on these. Um, to control. In this case, it's pretty low. You could you could use a parallel structure on here, but in, in reality, they're they're trying to keep the max doses off the femoral heads. So I, I I like when I plan to always sort of have like a one to a one to one correlation for my constraints. If anything, like the in the case of the serial, I'm actually taking three three DVH numbers and combining it into a single constraint. So I, in general, I probably have less than that. So we could start and just put in 40. I don't think we're going to have a problem with that. If you look here, they're, they're far enough away that I don't, I don't think we're going to have any problems. So let's just put in a 4,000 for a starting point on those, which is the more, the, that's the more conservative. You see 4,000 less than two. I, I'm sure we'll be much, much less than that. And I'm turning off shrink margin, but again, it doesn't really matter in this case. The, you can see here, though, that I, I'm using the, the PTV is my priority, and then I'm using external. And I'm going to get back to this one in a minute, but I'm going to use external to control the dose gradient inside of the patient. But I still want all these other structures to meet. So I'm just going to keep going through these real quick. Colon. So you can see I've got two. I've got a max of 6,000, and then I need to keep 2% less than 55. So in this case, I'm probably just going to use two, two quadratic overdoses since that's, that's so small. So 5,500. In this case, this root mean, the, the root mean squared dose excess at 2%, I, I could probably, um, I could probably let quite a bit. So maybe, maybe we can put in 20 here as a starting point. And then let's also put a separate one at 6,000. And this is going to control our max point dose. Okay, and we will turn these off. So this will control max point dose. And then let's see, we've got this something similar for the small bottle, 45 less than one, and then a max of 50, okay? So may maybe we'll start something like, like five to start. 
on that. And then I believe we had 5,000 on there. And then the pubic symphysis and the penile bulb. So 60 less than 30. So this, this constraint here, it, it, this is a good time to use a, a parallel cost function. So we can do 6,000. And I like to just enter in the value here, whatever that the mean organ damage is. So in this case, it's 30. 30%. So with, when it comes to the, the power law on this, this is a little different than serial. So the smaller the number, the more broad the impact on the, the entire dose volume histogram for that structure. So if we use a value of, of Z or a, a, like a value of, of four, it's, and we, we put in a, well here, in this case, it's 6,000. So the bulk of the impact is going to be around here and it's going to put pressure on the curve here. Right. And this is this is for like, I guess they call it a K, K, like a K equal four. OK, now, if I come in here, I don't know, can I switch the color in here? I'm not sure if Zoom will let me switch that. But here, so let's let's clear and then I'm going to come back in. So now it, instead, if I if I put a value of one in what it what it actually does is it starts to give pressure on the curve in a much broader area. So this would be like your, your K, like a K equal one here, um, as opposed to the previous one where it was more centrally focused. So we can use this to our advantage. Okay, and in this case, I'm gonna start with four. If the optimizer is not struggling with it, I, could, I can come in and, and decrease this value and make the impact a little more. So the, the value of this is that I, I can spare more of that structure if I need to. It, I'm, the physician might not be asking for it, but I think that the plan quality will be better if we can do better sparing for OERs, right? I mean, at the end of the day, right, that we should follow the ALARA principle as low as reasonably achievable. So that that should really be something we're always striving to do, try to keep our dose down as, as low as possible. Even if the physician is giving us a number that's higher, but if, if we can do better, we should always try to do better. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for this other one. 4,000 less than 50. So you'll notice that in general, I don't, I tried to not use DVH underdose or DVH overdose constraints to make any, to do anything to this. I, I tried to stay with biological constraints. I did have a section in this document that goes into some explanation of optimization. So in general, I like to run it in constrained optimization. So you can see this is this is the way this will work. So first order constraints, goals will always be met. Serial, serial, parallel, quadratic overdose, and max point dose. So you can see here, I, I'm, I'm sort of putting an emphasis on here. In the other case, if we use some of these other ones, like the underdose and the underdose DVH, um, it, it's a second order constraint. So it, these won't be met unless there's a first order constraint. Well, I, I don't really have to worry about that because I'm not using them at all. And then it's the same thing for, for objectives for the target. So the target UD or target penalty are your first order constraints. And then the goals are going to be met or succeeded unless constraints that are preventing your objectives. So th this is in a uh, constrained mode, okay? Which we're going to try running that in stage one. So let's get back to this external. So right now I've controlled the max point dose inside of the target, entire, the entire patient. I'm controlling the prescription isodose line of 70, but let's come in and, and actually add a couple other lines now. So you, you can pick however way, however you want this, but let's say we put in a 6,000 here and um, we ask ourselves, well, how much distance can we go between 70 and 60 gray? So I think we can come in here and, and say like, well, I think that gradient we can do about three millimeters. My guess is it's gonna be like three, three to six millimeters. So let's just stick with, with, with 0.5. This doesn't matter quite so much what you're using for the shrink margin. You'll see that it's still gonna push the dose down pretty well anyway. But if you push down too hard, well, let, let's do that. What you'll see is that the max point dose in the plan is going to start to creep up pretty fast. Really, when it comes down to max point doses and plans, it's it's the balance between dose gradient, the dose fall off around the target, and the max point dose. So the tighter dose you want on a structure, the higher max dose you need to be willing to accept. Okay, 
So let's come in here and we'll do 5,000 and we'll double that now. So let's do 0. 0.6 and we can do another one and we'll do 4,000. You can go with lower isodose lines. It just depends how, how tight you want those. In general, this is a pretty large patient. You're going to have some fingers coming out. So I, in general, I don't usually go too far below the, around the 50% mark is usually where I stop. So let's do 0.9 here. Okay. Now you can see here, I, I, I did give myself a little on the, a little wiggle room on the 70. So my guess is this is, this might, might push a little, but I, I strongly encourage you, you should give the optimizer a little more flexibility for these higher numbers when you're doing this. So I tend to not keep that uh, the root mean square error quite so tight on these. The prescription line, it, it can be helpful to start with a value of two, like two to five in that sort of range is a good starting point. The tighter you make this number, the tighter the isodose lines are going to be. So I think I've, I've covered everything that, that we would need to get this plan going. So just to review, stage one creates the ideal fluence maps. And stage two then converts ideal fluence maps and creates segment shapes and tries to recreate the ideal fluence maps that were generated in the first stage of the optimization. And the one thing that to, to keep in mind is actually at the end of stage two, there is this sort of embedded third stage, and that is the final dose calculation, where it will recalculate the entire fluent, the entire fluence distribution again. So what you'll notice is at the during stage two, the optimizer will look like it's doing a lot of work and you'll see things changing a lot, but then it, it almost will look as though like the optimizer froze up or something because there won't be any changes. So actually right before it finishes, the depending on your grid size, it might be running for five, 10, 15 minutes, depending on the, the size of your volume. It's actually, once it reaches its final goal, it will re recalc the entire plan. So remember, it's Monte Carlo, it's slow, it, it takes time, so definitely be patient. So I'm going to kick this off, and let's turn on the structure. So the other thing to keep in mind is, well, this, this went extremely fast, so that's great. I wish I would have put some of these numbers in here ahead of time. I thought I might have that actually on another plan. So you can see here, this coverage is, is pretty good. We should We should probably put these in. This is probably the thing that is can, can be a little tedious. So in this case, we need 7,095% coverage. So right now we're at 70%. And then let's add these in really quick. So this is maximum relative. And this is our rectum. So I'm just going to slide this over so we can we can see both simultaneously while we're while we're doing this. I did not mean to do that. Sorry. Okay. I'm just going to slide this over here. So we're going to put in 4,000, 35%. Okay, we'll just add all these in really quick. This will be maximum. So 6,500, 10%. This is where it's helpful to use the templates because the templates will actually store these. So if your physician is planning cases similarly every time, it's a great way to, to, to work on this. So you can see here, we're, we're not missing, but we're pretty close. We're supposed to be under 3%. Um, we're at 3.4, 10%, or at seven, and here at 35. So we might need to put a little more pressure on the tip of the curve in this case. And there's a couple of ways we can handle that. We can shift the entire curve to the left by increase, decreasing the, the, uh, the, uh, the, that mean dose or we can make an adjustment on the K value. So let's do the same here. This will be the maximum relative, and we're gonna do 4,000, 35%, and this will be maximum, and this will be 6,500 and 10%, and 7,000 and 3%. So you can see in this case, I, I'm doing pretty good that we're having really no problems at all with the bladder, but we are, we're having a little bit of a problem with this, this here. And to be honest, my guess is we, we, we have a little dose that's probably, there's a little overlap between the rectum and the bladder that's causing this number to be high. So let's make a quick adjustment in real time. So 
you remember I said we can we can turn this on or off. Well, in this case, since I'm going to have part of the volume that's going to overlap that and I want to control that, I probably I'm just going to turn that off since we're trying to keep that that down. And it, it well, it's made some changes already, but here let's let's run it through stage one again. And then we'll come back and take a look at the statistics table while that's running. So it's coming down a little bit and voila, it drops 3% by making that change to the plan. Here, you can see here, this has to actually, it has to do with the grid. So on this, this is the optimized. This looks at the raw grid for pixels, like voxels that are located inside. And you can see here it's at 97.6. This actually, the statistics table here is going to regrid at a, a more fine resolution. So unfortunately, for the purpose of demonstration, since I'm using a, a little coarser grid compared to the default settings for the DVH statistics, there's going to be a small discrepancy between these numbers. And that's just due to the overall partial volumeing effect of, of using a large grid spacing, but being evaluated on a smaller grid spacing. Let's let's put a couple of these other numbers in and just make sure that we're not we're not having any problems here. So I like to, for max point doses, so less 4,200. In Monaco, I never evaluate a max point dose. I always evaluate a 0.03 cc. I consider that to be a, a, a point dose inside of the planning system. I, remember, it's statistical in nature. If you drop the statistical uncertainty of the plan, usually those max point doses, yeah, they get smaller. So it, you can either, you can start out with a 0.03 or you can, at, when, when it's done, you can drop this total overall statistical uncertainty and reduce it a little bit and it'll go away also. So in general, our physicians here, I've, I've trained them all to understand that a max point dose in a Monte Carlo algorithm is a smaller volume. It's not a singular point. Okay. So in this case, 4,000 and then 2% for this. Clearly we're, we're way under on these and the same with this. I do, I do recommend while you're optimizing, it's always good to have these filled out. It makes going back and forth a lot easier. And here we're going to do absolute. So 4,200. Again, this is our max point dose, 0.03. Okay. Now we've got colon and uh, vowel we'll have to enter here. Let's slide this up. Okay. And so we will do a relative. And this one is 5,500 and 2%. And this will be max. So I'm going to do an absolute again, 6,000.03. Okay. Small vowel, relative 4,500, 1%. And max point dose of 5,000 at 0.03. Okay. And we can put this on your pubic synthesis, maximum relative 6,030% and 4,050%. So you can see right now, everything is missing. This is again, a partial volume on the corner. I, so I, it is always best when looking at these to realize that in stage one, if your plan does not look very good, you're gonna have some problems because stage two is never gonna come together. So. Let's let's kick this to stage two. So let's actually for for this for this purpose, let's turn on MCO. I, I should have I should have had that running actually the first time. So what MCO does is actually it, it continues to push the optimizer to further push down on those constraints. So instead of finding global maximum in the, the weighting cost function, it'll try to search for more local minimum. It, it will randomly drop other points in the weighting function to help it find find alternative solutions. So let's let's run this. It does it, it, it will increase the overall optimization time, but it does improve plan, overall plan quality. So I do I encourage you while this is running to take a look. There's a couple things. So the optimizer is automatically assigning weights to these, these functions right now. And right now, the only function it's really struggling with is the rectum. That's it. Everything else is not a problem at all. And if we look at our statistics, we're actually, it, we're, we're definitely exceeding. So there's two ways to handle this. So one way 
is we can increase this. We can ease up on this. So maybe let's go to like 5250. So we're allowing the whole curve to shift a little bit to the right by 250 centigrade. And then if we run that, theoretically, this, this weight will, will drop off a little. And you'll see the optimizer. Yeah, you see how the optimizer now is automatically bringing, it's putting less impact on this and it's coming down a little bit. Okay. The other one that it seems to be struggling with a little is, is this. But you can see there's actually a lot of room, this ISO effect here. So it's trying to get 100. It's currently achieving 8.2. But that's the impact of the MCO. So MCO is going to keep, keep pushing constraints to see if it can squeak out a little more on some of these structures. OK? And you can see the longer you let it run with MCO on, um, it might impact the overall plan quality. So like in this case, let's say, you know what, I'm totally fine with this meeting. It might be a, not a bad idea to disable MCO so it doesn't continue to look for more solutions to that one. The other thing that might be necessary, I, I used to do this in stage two, is I, I'll turn manual on and, and just set it to a very low value, something less than one, and that'll prevent the optimizer from continuing to push that structure a little further. Okay, and you can see here, all these structures, I mean, this is still getting pushed pretty hard. You can see here, though, my, my target coverage is, is suffering a little bit. And to be honest, it's happening because of this. So I will kick this. I'm curious how long this is going to take. It's a, I, I purposely wanted to do a, some, something small like a prostate as opposed to something that's larger because it's, the, it's Monte Carlo and it takes a little longer to do optimization. I do have another plan while that's running, instead of just waiting for something to finish up, um, I wanted to talk about another, another case. And I don't know that we're gonna have time necessarily to make it through, but I wanted to talk about how Monaco works very well when you have two dose levels. So this is a prostate of nodes. And so the prostate volume is going to 70, but the, the, nodes vo the nodal volume is gonna be going to 50, 40. So instead of creating ring structures, we don't have to deal with that. We instead, you can see here, I'm going to I'm going to turn off I'll turn off some of these. So in this case, this is the prescription for 70 and if we scroll down to the prostate, what you're going to see here is sure enough it's carving out the prostate. Now, if I come down here and what I've done here is I've carved out the prostate, but I've also carved out the nodes. And what I've done here is for the prostate volume, I've added a shrink margin of 1.2. So that expands the PTV by 1.2 centimeters. And then for the 5040, I have no margin. I, I left it at zero. So you'll see it'll, it'll be very tight on the nodes. So this is allowing me to control the 5040. And I'm giving it a little bit of a margin on the 70 because obviously there needs to be some finite dose gradient on here. So this is a very, a very useful tool in Monaco when it comes to controlling dose gradients as, as being able to do that. And the, you can see I do the same thing here. I give my 70 more of a margin than I do my 54 and to control some of the lower dose spill out further away from the target. Okay. Hopefully you guys have a have a handle on the shrink margins. I do think that in general, uh, in it, so I, I think the powerful things in Monaco are the ability to, to, to do MCO in combination with biological cost functions. And then the other thing that's very valuable so, are these, so these shrink we margins. We have a question if you allow us. I'm sure there's a question. Yes, I'm trying to unmute Javier. Yes, can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Could you please, the first question, why you put it external or patient above the OIR, organ at risk? This is the first question. Yeah, so I, I specifically do that to control the dose gradient around the target. And then <laughs> instead of, here. Well, okay. Let, let, let me open this other one because that, that one's optimizing. So okay. I, I use the shrink margins. So if you see here, like if I come down here to this structure, this includes, if I check this off, then the rank of the structures above gets included, right? The overlap priority, okay. right? So okay. anything above it. 
But if you deselect it, then that does not get included. So in general, I don't, I don't bother with the overlap priority. I, I usually have these checked off on most of my structures because usually these structures aren't overlapping any other structures below the external, right? Like your, your, your bladder and rectum are never gonna lap. These are all physical structures. There's not gonna be any overlap. So the, the value is I can control the dose gradient very tightly. If you put the structures above it, what I've noticed is that the optimizer is gonna let some dose, sometimes you can actually get more dose in certain organs because they're above the external. So instead of controlling the dose gradient specifically, it, it'll, it'll only control the dose gradient up to that OAR and then it'll carve out. So you might actually see some of these lines bulge into there. So this, I, I know in, 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 I, I, I've moved over to this. I believe it's in like five, maybe 511 is when they introduced the ability to have variable shrink margins. It used to be that you could only use a single. Once they introduced that into the planning system, I, I got away from using the priority. I've, I always put external above all of my OARs. It does a pretty so, good job of controlling those. Yeah, so you are not checking included in the box for the organ address. Yeah, I don't, I don't turn these on because they don't overlap. Okay. I, it, you'll see, like, if I were to turn this on, the dose would, like, first of all, I would lose dose. But secondly, okay. you would see on the cost function that it, it, would, it would change what's being occupied on that cost function, right? Yes. Yes. So well, what, what would happen you... is if this, this would say, if I checked this off, it would say that the cost function occupies no volume. It would give me an error immediately. Okay. Uh, are you prefer two two serial organ for the for example two two, two serial cost function for the rectum one with a low uh, power low function other with the high it means uh, for example use one or twenty to control high dose and low dose region are you prefer two serial cost function for one organ? So uh, this, this, uh, the, the power law exponent. So I, I will pick a value based on the organ that I'm using. So uh, oftentimes what I, I typically do is like rectum and bladder, it's somewhere between five and 10. It's probably closer to seven is what I'm using for most patients. I, I use cereal for these structures that have a lot rectum, bladder, when I'm in head and neck, it's probably mandible. If I'm going to do, let's say it's a, if I'm concerned with like DVH points, let's say if I'm in the lungs, like in a thoracic patient, I will I will use parallel structures and I might use multiple parallel. So like a, a, like the V20, I'll put a parallel in like a V20 less than 20 or, or 30, whatever it might be. And a V5, you know, less than 50%. I'll have two separate parallel functions that I'll enter. Whereas, so I, I do use, I probably use parallel more than I use else for, when I'm controlling, like trying to control DVH points on a curve, and they do, it does a, a relatively good job at that. So yes. here, here you go. I, I, I just, I, I, it was kind of driving me crazy here. The difference between my my DVH stats. So now you can see here, I'm meeting. I'm a smidge over on the rectum. This 0.82. So we could probably we could probably push that a little more if we need to. I know we're starting to run a little short on time, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time worrying about that. So. What, what we can do now in, in stage two, uh, this is back to that, that prostate only, is there's two ways to proceed. One way is I can go right into, I, I, could, I could stay in constraint and run it. If I, if I let, like in this case, I'm, I'm for the most part, I'm, I'm meeting everything. So I could switch it over to Pareto. So uh, a lot of the dosimetrists I work with for most plans, when they're trying to, to do something somewhat efficiently, as what they'll do is they'll come in here, they'll turn MCO off, okay? Don't touch anything else yet. They turn MCO off. Mm -hmm. If it turns off, okay? okay? And if you can switch it to Pareto, and if you hit the double arrows here, you know, it says down here, it'll says a continue stage one. But if you hit the double arrows, it actually will immediately jump to stage two. And you ran stage one Pareto, and now stage, or sorry, stage one we ran constraint. Now stage two, we're gonna run Pareto. Okay, 
And this, this technique works pretty well for most cases. Usually the optimizer did a pretty good job of pushing down dose. What, what I have noticed that is if you do constrained in stage one and stage two, the shoulder on your targets, you'll have a, a more broad shoulder in general. So usually after the end, you might have to come back in and make some adjustments, either cap the weights on some of the OARs that maybe the optimizer is pushing too hard for, or just maybe disabling a, stru a structure that the optimizer is too hard on. I mean, sometimes you can come in here and increase the ISO constraint too, if necessary. So a couple tricks while this is running. So I do use the optimization console here. If you, if you can, you can type in here shapes, shapes change and filter. This will let you know what iteration of the, the segment shape optimization loop the optimizer is running through. So I, I definitely will do this fairly, fairly often. It's nice to have it in the background. You'll see the progress meter here. You can see target EUD. So target EUD usually want to be one and then constraint violation. You usually want that number to like that to be, to get smaller. And then usually what happens is you'll see that the plan ends up modulating more. So modulation degree, degree, degree will increase with time. I, if you're trying to find the overall progress, though, I find that it's not it's not very helpful. So I see someone is asking to use Pareto for SBRT or SRS. I my personal practice is for SBRT, I usually run stage one and stage two constrained MCO because I don't care about the shoulder. So for SBRT and SRS, where you don't care about max point doses, constrained with MCO on stage one and two. Ali, would you like to just say it? Because uh, you have your hand up. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So for the previous cases regarding the MCO, did you check for the MCO for the sets too? Because I saw that it's checked and then you already got the final that's completed. On, on the other plan? Yes, the other plan. Yeah, so this this plan I I, I ran previously, I, I don't know that it's it's completely done, but I can pull it up while this other one's running. We have to be patient. It's it's Monte Carlo. It can take some time. So I will say that 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 is just a general observation that I have is always always be patient and allow the optimizer to complete what it's working on. So this one I ran. You can see here I ran at stage one and stage two MCO with MCO on, and we'll take a look at these. So you can see with MCO on for stage two, look look what happened. It looked very good at the end of stage one. I can back it up so you guys can see it. We can click this back. So this is at the end of stage two. You can see that by having MCO on for stage two, um, you'll, you'll look at all my constraints and for the most part, they're all really good, right? I think in this case had a little more bladder inside of the PTV than the other one, but everything is, if if anything, it's it's, for the most part, it's way under, with the exception of this bladder that I'm a little over on. And in most cases, physicians are are willing to come to you know back up on back off on some of these. But you can see here my target coverage isn't isn't so great. My 89%. So what unfortunately in a case like this, I would probably have to, to scale this up for coverage. So what you can do is after it's done, you can see here I had to scale it up one one percent to get my my coverage on, on my, my high PTV. So an alternative is as instead of scaling, we could just run this in Pareto, um, turn MCO off and then run one more iteration in. So that that's that's kind of a nice feature is you can run stage two constrained with MCO on. And if you're not happy with the results, you don't have to, to throw away what you've been working on. The nice thing is you can turn it, you can switch the constraint, the the optimization mode on in, in real time here. And you'll see it'll I, I can just kick this off now and I can let this run. So in, in terms of like what it in do in principle, what it's doing is when you're in Pareto, OAR, the maximum weight an o, a function can be at is 10. So it caps that number in, in like more like like a more pragmatic approach is that it's just capping these numbers. So it can't keep pushing them so hard. And it's not going to keep looking for more, you know, better and better solutions every time. But usually it's the more challenging cases that you're going to turn that off on where you're, you're not necessarily meeting. So let's let's see how this is doing and we'll go back to the other one. 
I, I apologize if I if I'm gone over. I know that it's. It, I, I apologize again. Monaco is is Monte Carlo, so it it takes a little longer time. I you know Eclipse is is great. It's very fast, but Monaco it you just have to be a little more patient with it. I, I feel like it can generate very high quality plans and very, do a very good job with organ sparing. But again, it, the cost is, is time. So you'll have to be, be patient as these things are running. So I believe to, you can see here, this is still kicking off. It's still, it's still segmenting here. Let's see what's going on here. So you can see here, it, it's, it's spooling up the number of segments. Once, once the first, once these batches get calculated, then it'll start doing doing its its stage two optimization. So you, you can see now it looks like we we went through that initial calculation, and now it's moved on, and now you'll see. So a couple of a couple of things I can talk about while this is running. So if you have more than one arc per per plan, it tends to the first pass through it'll work on the right side of the bank, and then the second pass through it works on the left side of the bank. And it will run through each, the SSO will run through each arc in order. So the first time through, it, it's gonna go through here and it'll spend most of its time making adjustments on this arc. And then after it's done with this one, it'll move to the second one. So in the beginning, you'll see like the plan quality will degrade pretty pretty quickly. And then you'll, you'll see that it, it'll bounce back over time. This is stage two. I'm just gonna turn off the stuff we're not really really caring about in this plan, just so we can get a better better picture of what's going on here. I see someone's asking about leaf violation errors. I don't come across those in the optimization council. I'm not I'm not sure where where you're getting that error from. That's not something that is is something I come across. I do come across optimization halted from time to time. And that is it's usually due to the fluence map not not seeing the entire plan very well. Yeah. Hi. Yep. Yeah. Just now about the leaf violated because I last week I felt like planning on the Monaco and then I saw when actually the planning is as SRS planning and I saw the the MLC like MLC leaf pair is violated. So and then it happened to uh, my planning and then at the end I cannot delete all the machines because Monaco I see that it doesn't give a hint like house. This planning can be delivered on the machine or not. So I check on the optimization console and then I saw the leaf violated message, but I'm not really sure whether that one could be a hint for the optimization, yeah, for the hint for the delivery plan or not. Yeah, I, I think I, normally I don't see leaf violations in, at least in Monaco. I, I mean, I don't know if this is a different, some, something else that you're seeing. If there is a violation, you'll get down here in a red box, it'll say optimization halted. Um, and yeah. then usually like if it's a really large volume or something, that's usually when I see that happening. Um, oh, yeah. So I think like, that one. Like a breast, for example, uh, we do a lot of breast, like IMRT breast plans. And if the, if like the, the breast volume is too large and at one of the gantry angles, you can't see the entire PTV, then you'll usually get optimization halted. So then we have to you know, move ISO center around to get it to a point where it, it's not going to cause that violation. Okay, yeah, because uh, during I could planning, sometimes I saw the like segment error report on the optimizations console, and also it says like the leaf number violated something. But I'm not really sure whether those informations can be take to consider that this planning cannot be delivered to the machine. Well, I know there's like the physical constraints of the MLC head. So I don't know what what MLC head you have, but the agility head. Agility, that's, yes. that's, what was that? Agility, agility head. Yeah. So there, there's a couple of like when when you when the model gets generated, there's a couple of like in, in principle rules. Uh, like for instance, you can't in, interdigitate, but you can only interdigitate twenty centimeters the from the furthest extended to the to the furthest re retracted leaf. And that's a physical constraint on the on the MLC. So I mean, if you ever look inside of the head, the MLCs ride in a carriage that also moves. So the carriage can move and the MLCs can move, but the MLCs can only move 20 centimeters outside of the end, the edge of the carriage. So that's a physical constraint on delivery. But I I I believe that Monaco, the, the physicists, when they put the model together for you, should be able to put to put these constraints in the model so that when it's optimizing your you're well 
like I said, I don't normally see violations in the console, but if I do see something, it'll it'll say optimization halted down here. But it's it, it's not that it's producing undeliverable segments. It's that the over like the overall geometry of the patient is is the problem that I'm having. Dr. Park, can I insert a question? Because Khan had his hand up for a while. So sure. he said, what is the benefits of using collimator angle? And there's another question saying why Monaco struggles by almost not like not able to make the conformity index compared to an Eclipse TPS. So the, I guess let's talk about the, the conformality one first. So are we talking about conformality index for SBRT lung? Is that what we're referring to or? Would you like to elaborate? Yeah, conformity index for any plan, some cervix plan or any prostate plan. So once we are, we'd like to have the conformity index for one. So we, we are not able to reach a one. So I can share one experience. Recently, there was a planning competition. So there- Wait, you, um, you, you try to get a conformality index of one of, of what isodotes line? The, the prescription no, index of one for the prescription? For the prescription, yes, for the target. Sure, but that's the ratio of the volume of the, 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 the target, like the prescription isodose line volume to the target volume. I mean, in general, so, it should be relatively close to one, but I, I would I would think that, yeah, I mean, one is perfect coverage, right? I can share the experience actually what happened actually. The, the conformity index, what I calculated from that equation, it was 0.998. But once my plan was evaluated by that software, they gave me 1.2. So I don't understand why it becomes 1.2 in that, that software and which was one in the... So what is the actual difference here happening? Oh, are you looking at the, are you looking at this under the sensitivity tab? Is that what you're talking about? The one that's automatically calculated in the planning system or what, what are you talking about? Or are you uh, just talking about the one that you calculate on your own? Yeah, when, when I calculated my own, yes. It okay. is not, it was about one, that means 0 0.998. But once I am done with that plan, then I submitted that plan with the software it showed me 1.20. Sure. So I, I will tell you that I, I rec recommend you be careful. So there's there's several different conformality indexes. There's the more common ones, but then there's there's there are some that maybe they they only look at the volume that's inside of the like isodose line. Some that exclude the volume. So just make sure that you the definition that they have is the same as the definition you have. Because you you will see differences in the conformality indexes. Oh, I'll, yes. I'll give you an example. So we do SBRT lung, and we we usually there's there's these national protocols, NRG protocols that we usually follow, um, and there is a constraint on the fifty percent isodose line for SBRT lung patients. And in those cases, I, I know that Monaco sometimes can struggle meeting that, but I, I think that. One of the reasons it struggles is that I, I've I've done comparisons between Monaco and the Eclipse has that Acros AB model, and we did some some in-house comparisons, and we find that actually that the the dose algorithm there's differences in the dose algorithm between the two. The Monte Carlo we feel that the Monte Carlo model does a better job in lung than some of the the uh, the other options that are available out there. I think that's where Monaco sort of it stands out. The other algorithms aren't necessarily providing like physical dose based on, you know, basic Monte Carlo principles. They're based on more, more of like a, a, a dose algorithm. So th there's going to be differences there. So in general, we see, we tend to find slightly higher doses in, in air in comparison to some of the other algorithms. So the other algorithms, it might look like you're achieving, but in reality, if you were to recalculate it using Monte Carlo, the that lower dose line is probably spread out a little, it's probably larger than what's being reported by the planning system. So okay. it's a, something to keep in mind. I apologize, okay. this, this, this is taking quite quite some time to go here. Yeah, I'm just adding one point with that, that uh, could you just explain, is the statistical, uh, uh, statistical uncertainty 1% uh, or 2% you are preferring? 
Go oh, sure. Let's, let's talk. Let me open this other one up. So this, this one's done, but let's talk about that. So I find that plan quality is better if you run it 3% per control, like uh, on per control point basis. And so you see here, I, I ran it 3%. However, we, we have a policy that we always want to make sure that the total plan uncertainty is under a percent. So if you, after it's done, you, you can go into optimization console and you can look it up here. So for the entire, entire calculation, I, it, in this case, I'm less than 1%, I'm at 0.74. But in this case, you can see that I actually set the, op, the optimizer to control each control point and to keep it at 3%. Right, so I find that you the 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 isodose distributions tend to be a little less noisy if you run it per control point as opposed to running it per plan for the entire calculation. So, it, it, the general rule of thumb here is we're usually somewhere between like three and five percent. The more segments you have, the higher the number can be. So, if you have let's say you know five hundred control points per arc and you have four arcs, I would probably run it maybe closer to five percent per arc. But if you have fewer segments, then that number usually needs to drop. But when it's all said and done, you can always go in and double check to make sure you're under a percent. But it, in general, that's that's our target goal is to keep it under a percent. Thank you so much. Could you please share some template line for some slide with us? Because this is important. We can understand the mission of your planning. If you can share head and neck and prostate and breast, we appreciate it. Many thanks. So here's here's the thing. I I'm okay. I have no problems. Maybe sending you guys some some screenshots of my constraints. I I'm not a big fan of sharing the template because everybody has different versions and it can cause your your plan to be corrupt. So like here, I think I'm running five five one ten. I think on this version. So I, there's there's small differences. So the the the, the main version is five one. I, I don't know what everyone's got. I think there's I think when Electa's up to six, I know we're, we're probably going to be doing an upgrade at, at the sometime in the in the future or not. But I, I I have no problem maybe giving you screenshots or you know I think what's helpful is there is it here I can. Yeah, here it's uh, I can send you like the advanced IMRT constraints for a couple of our plans to show you what what we have and this will spell out everything shrink margins surface margins er everything this I, it would probably be best if you you started with something like this and built on to what you had but then you can at least see what we did would yes that be, yes would that be okay yes it would be okay but if you can send some side like head and neck breast prostate and the cervix and for gynecology cases. I appreciate it. I know it takes some time. This, this is important for us. Yeah, so like a breast, a head and neck. Yeah, I, I, I can give you like an IMRT breast, a head and neck. I could do like an SBRT lung. Yeah, just so you can get a, get a feel. I mean, I can send you like a prostate and a nodes. All right. I apologize these are taking so long to, to optimize. I feel like in, in the live setting, anybody that's used Monaco knows these can these just take some time. Um, for us, it's, you know, something like this might take take a couple, like, you know, two hours or something. I, I usually will, when I'm working on this, I, I tend to multitask. So while I'm working on one plan, I'll, I'll usually let that one run for a while and then try to get other things done, well, you know, whether it's contouring or, or just working on another plan or something, just because it takes some time for the, the optimizer to march through that. I mean, it, you can see here, if, if I look for shapes, shapes changed here. So I'm only on my second SSO loop at the moment. And I mean, but the, usually like, Five, five loops is minimum, and you might want to go up a little higher. I, I didn't really talk about that too much. Like we can go and talk about that. But so in older versions of in older versions of Monaco, there this wasn't allowed, but now you can actually change this. So you can see here this I have set for 11. So it'll run through 11 segment shape optimization loops. And then once it gets through that, then it stops. 
every time you run through stage two, though, it'll run it through 11. If, if there's no, if the change is small, it's not going to keep going through them though. So that's just the maximum number of SSO loops. It might, it might finish in four or five. So in previous versions, this wasn't available. It would always default to five. You could change it. You could modify a, a registry key somewhere, but right now it, it, this I think goes from like two to 20, I think is the options on the slider bar. So I think by default, it, it usually comes in around five, but the, in general, the longer you let it run, usually the better the plan quality. So if you've got the time, I, I, I would slide this over to 20. If you know, you're in a pinch for time and the patient's starting soon, then I probably would, would stay away from that, but keep it, keep it like on the lower side. Dr. Park, while we're waiting, there's a question on why is the patient dose for Monaco more compared to the patient's parotid dose more in Monaco compared to Eclipse? That's an observation. There okay. Are... So there's there's two ways I, I can I handle I handle that. So parotid dose, I normally I usually use a parallel, a parallel constraint. And what I do is I will have like a parallel with a mean organ damage. I'll have it 50% with 2,600. And then if I still can't, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll actually turn the shrink margin on, and I'll you either set it to like zero or like one grid size. So like in this case, 0.3. So a, a shrink margin of 0.3. And then I'll run it. If, if I can't get the mean down at 2,600, then I'll, I'll drop it a little more at 26. Or conversely, you can drop the, um, the mean organ damage from 50 down to you know 20 or 30 percent, especially if there's a lot of overlap. The other trick that I do for that is I will also put a quadratic overdose and put a shrink margin on of maybe a you know a centimeter and then enter a value like a, 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 a an ISO effect value of like a thousand. So I'll, I'll try to keep the dose then outside of that to 10 gray. And I, I've had pretty good luck with it. I, I in general I don't usually struggle too much with parotid glands. I think the, the, the key to that is to, to understand what the dose gradient needs to be in the parotid and then to use quadratic overdoses to control the dose gradient and, and or the parallel constraints for parotids. I know this is still running. I, I, I apologize. I, we could, I, I feel like I, I want to scrap this and start from scratch real quick I and mean, just change the grid to something really high so we don't have to, to wait so long just to see. I, Normally what I'm doing is while this is going on is I, I'd start to take a look at these weights and these effects and to see what constraints I'm struggling with. But I usually let this run all the way through start to finish. Once you get a really good template, to be completely honest, I, I don't have to make many adjustments when I'm done. I might need to make some small adjustments. It, like the, the example of prostate is usually you have like the patient had a hard time keeping their bladder full. So you have a hard time meeting the bladder numbers. So sometimes you have to have the conversation with the physician and be like, well, maybe we need to, to resim this one or they need to fill their bladder a little more. The other thing we do is sometimes we try to create like an artificial minimum bladder filling contour that'll get sent over to the LINAC that they can use to decide if their bladder is going to be full enough for daily fractions. That one is also helpful. Yeah, I just, th this one's, this one's taking quite some time to run. I think, what do we have? This is, I think I had, I thought there was just one arc per beam on this. Yeah. So I'm still struggling a little with the rectum. And then you can see the target coverage is definitely on the low side at the moment. But why don't I do that? I'm, I know we're way over on time. I don't know if, if every, if we even have that many people left around. We still have 120. Okay. Let's let's let me just restart this and then Monaco isn't isn't the best planning system for live demos. I'll say that. Let's let's just increase this to something larger. And then maybe I will do like this. Dr. Pro, while we're optimizing, I'm gonna insert another question. It, they're asking what is what is the inference from pro progress meter and what is the permitted degree of modulation from the progress meter? So yeah, so there's the modulation degree. So the more the more the more more modulation. So if you this is much faster. So here, I just want to make sure this is still looking good, and then we'll kick this into. To, and I will talk about these while these are running. So if you look at the, the monitor units, it's basically 
the more modulation there is, the I call it the IMR, the IMRT factor. You use it in shielding calculations, but it's the ratio of the total monitor units to the fractional dose. So you can see right now we're at a at a at about a four. So a f like four to one, four four times more monitor units than dose. And the more it, the more modulated it gets, you're going to see that this this number will increase. So the more complicated the plan is, usually this number will go up. And there is no upper limit. It, it doesn't cap it at any value. So I find that our model does pretty well up to about a modulation factor of, of, of between like eight and 10. And then when I do IMRTQAs, I, the, it, it starts to, it, the, my pass rates start to go down a little bit. So it's something to keep in mind if you're trying to get plans to pass QA, that if it's sometimes it can be overmodulated and Maybe when you initially evaluated your model, you didn't you didn't put that much emphasis on MLC leakage outside of the field. So if you had any errors during modeling, they get amplified as modulation degree increases. So keep an eye on that. If it gets if it goes up too high and you can't get your QA to pass for some reason, it, it could be that you just overmodulated the plan. And there's a couple ways to get around that. So Fluent smoothing is a really good tool to reduce that. You can you can turn fluent smoothing on and it'll decrease your modulation degree pretty significantly. The other thing that helps to reduce modulation degree is if you're if you're willing to accept a higher max point dose um, or if you maybe reduce your your dose constraints a little on the on the on like the dose gradient around the target with those external structures. Well, I, I'm glad I'm rerunning this. This is coming together a lot more quickly now, and we can take a look at these stats. So there's a couple of things it's still struggling with. It looks like the rectum, this high, the high doses still needs to come down, but it's still it's still optimizing here. So, so this is getting close. And my my 35 35 percent less than this is is off a little bit. So normally. But this isn't surprising. If you remember, we we decreased this number quite a bit. So let's let's drop this back down and let the optimizer push a little harder. Right now, you can see here based on the weight. Usually, if you look at these weights towards the end of optimization, if the weight is above one, what you're going to notice is that like as it gets close to finishing up, it'll it'll be pretty close to to zero. It'll be this like really small values, 0.01. So it basically means the optimizers achieve the constraints and it's not really putting any more effort on there. So I see someone asked, is there an advantage to use two rotations per arc over one? So I think for, for most of my plans, I'm usually doing two arcs per two arcs per rotation per beam, and I do two beams. That's probably like 90% of what I do. I will increase the number of arcs per beam for more complicated cases. Head and neck, I for my more complicated head and neck cases, I will I will typically run, I'll do like two arcs and then do four arcs per beam for the more complicated cases. Like if I have three or four dose levels, like me, if it's a bilateral, so things like this, where there's a lot, a lot going on. Some of our physicians here tend to contour nodes all, all the way down to the, the, uh, the aortic notch. So yeah, that's, it's just a function of, of how, how challenging the plan is. So in this case, let's turn this off. My my PTV70 is not is not looking so so great. So you can see here I, I I was pushing that. Now if I go back when we ran stage one, I I, I made the mistake I didn't run stage one in constrained. So I'm just going to come back here and turn that on. That seemed like it ran pretty quick this time. Okay, and let's reset this. This looks like it only took a few minutes before. So hold on. I just I, I want you guys to be able to see something. So I have fluent smoothing off, and we have a lot of we have a lot of segments on here. I think I have that set to we have let's let's increase that to two for this one. And and we will run this. Okay, so there is our stage one. It's done. And Let's just take a quick peek. All right, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna I'm gonna kind of ignore this. That's a partial volume effect, but it looks like everything else is is meeting pretty well now. And then we'll go back to constraints, and I'm gonna switch this to Pareto 
here. And the other thing we are, so we'll kick this off. And you can see here, I'm, I'm really pushing on this. So I'm gonna, I usually disable this on my stage two when this is going, because it, I, I feel like it over constrains the plan. And then it causes that shoulder to get a little more broad. It's a, it's a standard practice for me. I, I, I will try to keep the, like the equivalent of like maybe 105% in stage one, I'll try to keep it under 105. And then I'll, I'll disable that on stage two. There's a couple ways you can handle it. One is like, you could come in here and maybe you could keep it on and, and keep this, and this will help control some of the, 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 the 7245 by just easing off on that ISO constraint. All right. Well, let's go on. Any, is there any other, other questions that we could answer maybe while we're waiting? Yes, Dr. Pop. So another question is, is, is it usual to use the underdose DVH for coverage? I, I, I would prefer to not use the underdose DVH. So I'll, I'll explain that. So if we go to this document, the, there's the two ways to do this. So if you're doing Pareto, that you could probably get, get away with it. But if you're doing constrained, I find that you get better plan quality with constrained. You might not get that perfect ideal ideal curve, but I think in general, I we do a pretty good job. We get pretty close. You just have to make sure that you're patient enough and let let the optimizer do its thing. But if you can, if you see on here, it's a second order constraint. That's the problem, and it's the same with this. So this is a first order objective. So you're going to try to control it with a second order constraint. This quadratic overdose or the underdose DVH. So it might help push the dose up when you're in the Pareto mode, but in constrained mode, I, I don't feel like it, it does that good of a job. I, that's why I, I, I'll, if you see here, I, I usually do two, two target penalties. I prefer to understand why I'm having target coverage. So I, like if I have like, you can see here, like right now this plan, the, really the only thing that I seem to be struggling with is this probably the rectum. So it, like if you actually come in here and you take a look at the rectum, there's probably some physical reason why we're having problems with the rectum, right? So you can come in here and I mean, it, this, this rectum isn't, isn't terrible, but it, you can see the constraint that we're trying to meet for the rectum. So really the four gray, we, we need to keep that pretty low, right? The four gray line or the 40 gray line, I'm sorry. Let's turn that on. So we have to keep it pretty tight. And you can see the optimizer is doing a pretty good job of pulling it away. But you got to remember they drew the prostate and there's probably, we have a CT on rails here. So I think we, we normally do three millimeter expansions on our, on our prostates to the PTV expansion. So that means there's three millimeter of overlap of the rectum, most likely three millimeters of overlap of the rectum. And the rectum's got a couple spots where it's a little on the narrow side probably down here, right? So look look how much overlap we're going to have. And we're trying to keep that 40 gray less than 35%. So I think there's like a physical reason why it's happening. You can, at the end of the day, you know what you can do is, I mean, what, the tendency is to come in here and push, like I really need to push to get coverage on my PTV 70 because I need 95% coverage. Well, you can do that, but just remember then, your OAR is going to suffer. So that's why I, like for stage one, I like to do constrained. And then that gives me like the ideal best solution possible. And then stage stage two, I will, I will run at Pareto if I'm struggling to get some coverage. It'll still prioritize the coverage, but it, I, I tend to see less of a detriment to my, my organs at risk. How are these coming? I mean, this this actually is coming together pretty pretty good, guys. I'm I'm meeting everything, and I haven't really had to make any changes to speak of anything significant. It's coming along. Let's take a look at the number of shapes that we're we've gone through here. So we're we're actually still in our first SSO loop. So I I really think this is gonna gonna come along here, right? It's, we can probably bring this in. I'd probably let this run a little longer. It's still in the first SSO loop, but if you come in here and we look, so I, you see, I, I eased off on this quite a bit. So you can see that's the 7245. And then you can see here, these are those rings that we put on. 
So right now we're asking for, you know, like 75 or getting 19. And then for prescription, it looks like we're doing a pretty good job. We could tighten that up a little if we need to, but every, everything is meeting. And I mean, to put things into perspective, let's, let's just take a look at our rectum. Like here, you know, rectum, we wanted 65 less than 10. And I mean, I, you know, this, this overall, it's, it's doing a pretty good job. This, I, I did pick a somewhat challenging case. This is, I think this is a Folkman protocol. There's a, some research protocol in the U.S. And they, they tend to, to, to do a higher dose per fraction. This is the, the, like the 250, 250 centigrade per fraction, but they tend to have to push a little harder on, on some of these. Some of our older protocols like the 72, the 7560 protocol, the 7560 and 42 that we used to do, we, you know, at 40 gray, we would allow 50%. And I, I think was it six, 65 was like 20% and then 70 was 10. So it, these numbers are definitely harder to meet because you're going at a higher dose per fraction than the 180 per fraction compared to the, the other prostate only protocol. So I'm sure everybody, everybody at every site is going to have different constraints that they're trying to achieve. So, so something, something to keep in mind. I think it's also valuable to talk to your physician because if, if you do have a problem meeting something, you know, they, they might, they might be pushing for a protocol that's 70 and 28 and you can't get it. And it's, they've got a small rectum and, a, and they can't fill their bladder. Well, maybe they, they need to hyperfractionate and, and go, go to more fractions so that they can ease up on some of these OAR constraints. It'll usually give them a little more flexibility when it's in a, a hyperfractionated instead of a hypofractionated state. So the infeasible status is, that's a good question. So what this is telling you is if you go over and you look at the relative impact, it, the relative impact is high. So when you get this infeasible, it, the optimizer is saying that I've maxed out. So in Pareto mode, OAR is the highest weight that they can get be given is 10. So it's telling you that if, if we leave this constraint at 10, it's not gonna, it's never gonna be able to meet this constraint that you gave it, which is fine because in this case, we gave it 5,000, but we're still meeting our underlying constraints. So there's, no, there's nothing to be concerned about. But in, let, let's say you were running in Pareto and you only had one constraint. Like let's say you wanted to push the rectum a little more. You have some options here. So one option is to click the manual button and then enter in a higher value. And this is similar to what you do in Eclipse where you assign it like you're manually assigning weights. So you can, you can, that's sort of like a hybrid mode where the optimizer is handling all the other weights and then you're manually adjusting one of the weights. So that, that's one option. The other option is when I'm in constrained mode, I actually have the tendency to do the opposite. So if I'm in constrained mode and I'm oftentimes what happens is the optimizer pushes structures too hard. So what I'll, instead of increasing the weight, I will actually decrease the weight when I'm in constrained and running through a plan. Okay. So this plan here, I think is, is pretty, pretty close. Let's take a look at the dose distribution. I granted, please forgive me, but we, we ran this in, in lieu of time with a larger grid spacing. So the, the isodose lines don't look quite as smooth, but we, we needed to get it done in a reason, you know, a reasonable amount of time, even though I've, I've gone over 45 minutes. I apologize for that. So you can see here, we're, we're meeting everything. The, the isodose lines look relatively conformal. Again, this, this is the 40, 40 gray, so my 70 to 40 gray. Let's, let's measure that just for kicks here. And, you know, it looks like we're around two centimeters, which is pretty, pretty reasonable. You know, it's a little tighter here. We're at like maybe 1.2 in the areas where we need it. So that's one thing. I, I always think of isodose lines like a balloon. If you push really hard here, the, the, the dose comes out somewhere else. So, you know, you put pressure here, your other isodose lines have to extend out a little further. So the more constrained your, your plan is in certain areas, then you probably need to reevaluate your constraints, the, the external contour constraints that you're using to control dose gradient here. So I know I... I, I do work a lot with people at Electa. I know in the US, Paul Berry and David Lee, I, I know that this technique here with the, the constraint, the external directly under the targets, 
that's something that they also use. Uh, we specifically, we have an MRLNAC here, so we've we've tried to come up with techniques that accommodate the MRLNAC and our source, you know, our CRM Linux. And we find that those th this technique works very well. In general, it's probably a lot different than maybe what everybody else is used to doing. I think what people were initially taught on the planning system. But since we've gotten that new version where we, we can do variable shrink margins and we can turn off OARs above and the overlap priority, I, I find that in general, these plan the plan quality is pretty well and we can control those pretty well. So I apologize for going over on time. I know if I'm willing to stick around and ask more questions, but I, I don't think I'm going to do any more optimizing here. Dr. Farr, there's an additional question, if you still have some time. Yeah, yeah. So are you recommending to use toe serial or toe parallel cost function with high and low power? I'm not sure what you're asking. Maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, so here, let's let's just open up a document. I'll, I'll In general, I'll tell you what I what I normally do. I mean, when I when I have a wish list like this, like something like this, there's two ways to approach it. One is to do parallel, a couple of parallel structures. And the other way is to do to do one serial. Okay. I will say that for mean, for parallel, for parallel constraints, so parotid, we've got uh, th these are these are the ones I usually use. So parotid, salivary, salivary glands, constrictors, what else? The larynx. These tend to be mean doses, right? Oral cavity, serial structures for head and neck. I tend to do like mandible, but what else? I spelled that wrong. So let's think lung. I usually, I will use like two parallel constraints. One at like 20 gray and then usually one at five gray. Heart, I, I'll usually use two, two parallel again for these. And there'll be one for the mean dose, depending on what I'm going. And then one for like, I don't know, it's usually like a, like a V20 or V15 depending on like what dose levels, like a, maybe like a V15 or a V20 for the other one that I'm usually controlling. What I do, I will say when I'm doing breast plans, I do not, I, I don't do any of these. I only do max dose. I delete all of these for breast. And if you're doing breast plans, that's something to consider. The other thing for breast plans is I turn auto flash on and I try to leave it at two centimeters if possible. So if you're doing breast plants, keep that in mind. I'm just trying to think of other, other things. So obvi obviously like rectum, bladder, our serial, usually here, this quadratic overdose, I'm usually doing, this is like neural structures. So like cord, uh, like your, your cord PRV, like cranial nerves, optic nerves, brainstem, that's all, usually I'm doing like quadratic overdoses on all of this stuff. So this, this, this is like, instead of max doses, like, okay, that definitely that. The serial, serial think like in general, if you have like, like three or, or more DVH points, then use a serial. If you have, Think of this as if you have like a mean or like two or less DVH points. That, that that's in general, that's that's kind of the way I use that. I I don't when it comes to targets, targets like PTVs, I'm gonna use a, a target penalty. I I I personally I never use I never use underdose DVH. Because remember, I, I switch back and back and forth between constrained. I, I switch back and forth between constrained and Pareto. I, I don't, I, I like having the ability to go back and forth between the two. So if you get a plan set up and you're using an underdose DVH, well, the priority sort of changes when you go between Pareto and, and constrained. And I, I prefer to use, I prefer to use biological constraints, the serials, the parallels, and quadratic overdoses. I don't use underdose, overdose, and maximum point dose functions when I plan. And I, I find that in general, I, I get much better OAR sparing 
I, I can follow Alara principles better as low as reasonably achievable. I can keep doses a lot lower. You might get, you know, your target coverage might look better on paper, but if you can't spare organs well, uh, and in, in some cases much better than maybe you, you even the guidelines, I, I personally think that it's better to have a hot plan and better OAR sparing than to have spectacular, you know, spectacular coverage. It's not very hot, but then all of your OARs are getting more dose. So, I mean, ho hopefully this, this will kind of give you some ideas about what we're doing. Just a, like a taste of what we do. I know like Electa has got some guidelines, but these are sort of my personal preferences for a lot of these structures. The reason like mandible, I usually have on here, I usually have like three DVH points on these. And this is sort of helps me control because the serial cost function, remember when it's a, a Z equal one, it's very similar to a parallel constraint. It gives you mean dose. When you have a, the, when you increase the, 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 the exponent to 20, then it's more of a serial structure. So one, it's parallel, 20 is serial. Whereas with parallel, Remember, a value of four is very similar to a DVH, whereas if you go to a value of one, then it, acts, it, it, it broadens its impact to the curve. So things to keep in mind. A any, other, any other questions for those that are, have stuck it out? So Adi had another question about what CF do you use to control OER dose and overlap between OER and target? Okay, so if we go back to this one, I, I specifically, I will use the shrink margin status. So if I don't want to, if I don't want to have, over, like, if I don't want to include the overlap, let's say like the example is the parotid, right? So the parotid is probably, oftentimes it overlaps your PTV. So it's, the optimizer does better if in that case you use a shrink margin on your PTV but then make sure that you, you, you'll often use the parallel structure. So like, let's, let's go down, did I use a parallel? Yeah, we used a parallel. So in that case, like I would put maybe 2,600 for the parotid and amino organ damage of like, you know, may, maybe like 50% as a starting point with a, a exponent of four. But then I will usually check off this and, and do zero margin on it. So that would, that's, I'm only gonna optimize the part of the parotid that is outside of the PTV in that case, okay? The other thing that happens from time to time is, let's say your PTV is overlapping your cord, but the physician tells you that the max coverage that they're going to allow on a cord is like 45 gray, right? But you're, you're taking it to, let's say it's like a 50, 40 or something like in an, in an abdomen case. So in a case like that, I will ask the physician for permission to modify their PTV and carve out the cord plus some margin, usually like three millimeters. And so I'm trying to still get coverage on the, on the target, excluding the OAR. So I will do that. The, the, the one thing to keep in mind though, is that you can't, you can't use a shrink margin on targets from, from OARs. It would be a nice feature that, you know, maybe Monica will put in, in the product in the future to also be able to include OARs on the list. So you could, you know, modify your your PTV so it excludes those but excellent question